Uh, thank you. It's very, very nice to be here. Um, uh, I'm a, uh, a skate to where the puck is going to be kind of guy, and uh, uh, I uh, got interested in this uh, arcane topic uh, when, after Deepwater Horizon, the United States started to uh, emulate, uh, uh, to, to adopt, uh, look at uh, Norwegian and British regulation, and uh, uh, I have a long-standing interest in uh, uh, the problem of regulation under uncertainty, and I thought looking at the the model might be an interesting window into um, where things are going. So here's here's the story. Uh, first, I want to give you a very big picture. Um, uh, uh, the, this is there are a number of examples at the beginning of the paper uh, of the to illustrate this uh, tendency. Uh, you have uh, uh, ground level actors uh, who are faced, who recognize that they are uh, co producing uh, uncertainty, uh, potentially catastrophic uncertainty. So that's a, a result, in a way, of a, you have a more innovative economy. Um, for reasons I won't go into, uh, you get vertical disintegration. You have a more innovative economy. Uh, the innovation uh, uh, creates good new things and potential hazards. Um, uh, and when you do this at a global scale with global supply chains uh, across multiple industries, uh, uh, bad things can happen. The rational response to that uh, is, is not to say uh, we can uh, anticipate uh, uh, ex ante what to do and we'll do the best we can and that's the rule. It's to understand that your ex ante uh, 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 efforts at mitigation are going to be necessarily insufficient, and therefore they should be designed to be corrigible. And uh, one of many ways of, of correcting them is by creating event notification systems where you see that uh, uh, out of control sequences, things that violate your expectation of what uh, mitigation is supposed to do are reported, responses are developed, and ultimately in the, in the most developed cases, uh, people check to see whether or not the, uh, the mitigations are effectively applied. Uh, and if you want a kind of like a big example of this in the world of production, it's uh, lean production, Toyota production, bufferless production where you, the factory uh, 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 essentially assumes, the factory designers assume that they can't design an efficiently, uh, uh, oper robustly and efficiently operating factory. And the factory is designed uh, so that disruptions are easily visible and uh, therefore more easily detected and corrected. In fact, the idea is you have no buffers at all so that when there's a disruption, you have to intervene. Uh, in order to get things going again, you have to identify the source of the disruption and improve, in that sense, the factory. Hence, these things are called continuous improvement uh, systems. But the general idea is they are, they are very deliberate recognitions of the impossibility of robust uh, ex-ante design. And there is an equivalent. On, Lean production is obviously about production, uh, but there are equivalents in the design process as well. So what's the regulator's response to that ground level response? This is all under the qualification that the actors are capable, and we can talk about what happens when they're not capable and so on. But anyway, under the, that assumption, what's the regulator's response? Uh, the regulator's response is not to try and make of course, not make you know kind of uh, comprehensive uh, and and fixed ex ante ex ante rules, but rather to uh, in, encourage the the uh, initial best efforts, uh, create help create and support uh, whatever infrastructure is necessary for continuing uh, uh, improvement, and and to use the information generated by those processes to set and and adjust uh, benchmarks. And in the, the paper, just uh, cite a whole bunch of examples. Um, uh, one of them I'll just mention, uh, INPO, the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations, which is a very well-developed uh, system of um, event notification and uh, 
uh, uh, correction and review of the correction in the U U.S. nuclear operating plants. It's in a good example of this. Uh, before Three Mile Island, you have a stable fleet and of reactors, and you get a lot of incidents. And after the impo system is introduced, the thing stabilizes, and the same thing is the same methods are applied to the Chern Chernobyl. Uh, fleet after Chernobyl, and uh, uh, you get a similar stabilization, so a little natural experiment. Uh, the court's response, uh, the court's response is, it's just, we're talking about, you know, meta meta, so the court's response is to uh, enforce the obligation, in, 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 to make sure that the agency is living up to its responsibility to enforce the obligation to, to uh, make and correct and update uh, these mitigation plans, um, uh, and and there are. I, I want to just, uh, in a nod to the uh, Nick's kind of concern. I, it's this is an easily justiciable, administratable uh, rule in the sense that it's. If, if you look at, at at recent cases, it's quite easy to tell when an agency is utterly incapable of uh, 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 monitor of, of of living up to that responsibility. So. All of this is, uh, I, I want to argue, uh, not, not quite uh, like Adrian. I want to say that the, uh, uh, the reality you see before you is, is uh, an illusion and that the, really the reality is the one that I'm uh, depicting. But I do want to say that there are strong currents in, in that direction. Uh, uh, and nonetheless, I want to be clear that what I'm suggesting here uh, what I what what we observe uh, is is in very strong contrast to the U.S. mainstream debate about regulation in general, and maybe it's not worth not 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 uh, um, uh, without purpose to recall that debate uh, for purposes of this conference because it is the background against which we're discussing uh, things. So uh, um, the. The assumption that I'm making is that faced with uh, jointly produced uh, 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 uncertainty, there's a common interest between the, the first level, the firms, first level actors, ground level actors, and the regulator to, uh, to, to investigate the possibility and uh, investigate and improve uh, mitigation uh, possibilities. And the standard assumption is there is everywhere and always uh, an information asymmetry in favor of the, the primary actor who is re reluctant to be regulated uh, and, and uh, therefore can outgame the, uh, the regulator, and that ability is augmented by these, these familiar factors, uh, um, uh, the, the capture and, and the it's, also, it's put in a very embarrassing way in the literature. Basically, the government can only afford to hire dumb people. Uh, so the regulators are incompetent as well as captured, as well as disadvantaged. And the result of that, if you read this literature, especially the literature about offshore uh, drilling, um, uh, it, it's this. It says, uh, just forget about regulatory oversight. By the way, I, just to be clear, I... I uh, I, I think uh, Adrian is to be commended for, for asserting the sensibility and dedication and, and knowledge uh, of reservoir in, in administrative agencies. I think that that's, all of that is really true and it is completely neglect, it is completely omitted from the current debate. You wouldn't, if you haven't read it, uh, um, uh, you, you, you should because it's really quite remarkable. Um, the response to, there's a, a book by, uh, Kerry Colianese, edited by Kerry Colianese, on regulatory breakdown and renewal, and the essays, two essays, one by Dickie Zeckhauser, very uh, you know good economist, uh, and another by Lord Benyard, and they come to exactly the same conclusion: forget regulation, absolute liability, an insurance system. Problem with an insurance system is you have a power law distribution of risks. The, the chance in a normal distribution that, that once you've seen the second tallest person in the, in the world, that the, the next, the, the, the tallest person will be twice as large as, the, as, high, as tall as the person you have, have observed is essentially zero in, many, in you know, many universes. Power law distribution, there's a good chance that the next, the, the unobserved next, next uh, person will be twice as tall as the last one. So it, insurance is a somewhat tricky notion in this setting. Nonetheless, that's, that's the idea. 
Uh, so they've just given up on agencies, and, and in fact what they suggest is that, that uh, you've got this government workforce, you should train them in minimal actuarial skills so that they can help administer the insurances. And so Norway is an interesting test case. Norway was, we're directed to it, we, I confess I was expecting to find something else in Norway. Um, anyway, Norway is an interesting test case. Uh, it looks like it fulfills the prescription, absolute liability, no bureaucratic rules, uh, in the, a, a very, very clear obligation of firms to search out uh, uh, best solutions uh, regardless of what current practice is. Um, uh, and uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, when you look closely, this is the agency to which the United States was looking after Deepwater Horizon. When you look at what was going on at just a month after Deepwater Horizon, they had a near miss, which, which a d identical situation, but for a favorable wind. There would have been another, it was a cement problem, and, uh, but for a favorable wind that dispersed the gas on the platform, there would have been an explosion of the, exactly the same Deepwater uh, type. And, and uh, uh, that was the reprise of an earlier near miss, same company, very same circumstances. The deep problem is information, man inability to coordinate uh, uh, in the making and revision of plans. And when uh, oil drilling is like, a hus is like an, an extended operation, you have a team of people that come together and they're operating on the, the patient is the, is the, the hole in, the, in the, the, the earth's crust that they're drilling and uh, lots of stuff uh, happens and if they can't adjust, uh, especially under high temperature and high pressure, bad things. You, 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 apply, the US, you apply the US remedy, you don't, you don't get what, what you expect, and then the question is what, is, what are the actors actually doing? And the, the bulk of the paper consists of looking in detail at what the actors are doing. There's two pieces, one is what they're doing in production and the other is what they're doing in regulation. And for purposes of this discussion, you can read the, 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 the detail. What, what, what you see is that uh, the, the regulator together with the trade association representing all the firms operating, all, uh, licensed to operate on the Norwegian continental shelf, uh, build up an incident reporting system over a period of 15 years that moves from uh, well drilling, uh, well, to well control during, during the uh, drilling process, uh, well integrity, maintenance of the well after it's been drilled, plugging and abandonment, the whole cycle, and they use uh, the incidents that are reported uh, in these things, pooled information from the different firms, they use that information for to establish new standards, which in turn become uh, regulations. They're incorporated by reference. Um, and the result is that the updating mechanism becomes the rulemaking mechanism. That's, that's what's going on. And uh, uh, the exact, the legal status of this is, is uh, under discussion, I would say. But that's the de facto, that's the de facto emergent system. So what you see is, that the model entity, the, the one that looked like it was doing a good job based on something approximating the US uh, uh, situation is in fact doing, uh, beginning to do a very good job. And by the way, let me just add that um, uh, they are doing this uh, by, by explicating uh, tacit knowledge. Let me give you a very quick, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not sure where exactly the extent of disagreement here, but. But um, there is a cost to doing it, uh, but it's, it is doable. And so here's, a, here's an illustration of what it is that they actually do. So it turns out that there are hydrocarbon leaks. Uh, and the initial assumption was that the leaks were caused by equipment failures. It turns out that the, the problem, when you start to dig into it, the problem is caused by, by maintenance failures. But the maintenance failures are not caused by inadequate training. The maintenance failures are caused by poor specification of the initial instruction, often weeks and months before the maintenance operations are carried out. So there was, in order, in order to come to that conclusion, it was necessary to make, to look very deeply into the actual operations of things. And that's typical, not exceptional. That's typical of the kinds of processes uh, by which uh, 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 catastrophes are, are mitigated, 
but it's also an observable, that process is itself observable. An agency can observe whether or not firms are doing this, and a court can observe whether, whether an agency is doing it. Uh, finally, uh, it just, just so, uh, because there are economists present, you, you, you might want to know that it turns out that this is not, uh, there's not a, a sharp efficiency safety trade-off where doing, producing the information necessary for for uh, mitigating catastrophe is at the cost of economic efficiency. On the contrary, it turns out that the, coordinate, the underlying coordination problems are very similar and that when you get good at one, you tend to get better at the other. And there's an interesting set of new firms emerging on the Norwegian continental shelf which are doing both. This is just to restate. Uh, um, this is just to restate what's been said. There's the first order actors uh, don't satisfy. Uh, I think all actors actually satisfy with my, my uh, understanding of the, the sort of terminology here. That's not, uh, they, 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 don't sat, they, don't, they don't just uh, uh, set an arbitrarily, uh, 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 they don't tune the alpha to something and then say stop. They, they make rebuttable provisional rules and then improve on the rules. Uh, the regulators are beginning to support them. Uh, and then the question is, uh, there are some examples where courts, courts certainly tolerate this all the time. Uh, the question is whether there is a doctrinal support for encouraging it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Matt Spitzer. and. Uh... I'm a professor at Northwestern University School of Law and director of the Searle Center on Law, Regulation, and Economic Growth, uh, which means I put on events sort of like this. Some of you have been to them. Uh, so it's my privilege to comment on this uh, really interesting paper by Charles Sable and a couple other guys, uh, Regulation Under Uncertainty. And there are a lot of ideas in this paper, uh, partly about monitoring and recursive regulation, partly about modularity, partly about Norwegian oil safety as a case, which sort of demonstrates some of these. Uh, it takes up most of the paper, but I'm going to say by far the least about it, uh, because it requires a certain amount of case-specific tacit knowledge that for some reason I'm lacking. Uh, it, so, so monitoring ha you know, has a couple of basic regulatory tasks, according to this paper. You've know, you got to be smart about finding complex risks. And you've got to induce ongoing monitoring and update regulations and safety practices based on new information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this a little further than the paper does it. I want to talk a little bit about big data. Uh, why? Because I like big data. Okay. So, so we are having a march of big data through our society. If you haven't noticed, uh, advertising has been transformed by Google. If you drill down far enough, almost all these examples have Google underneath them because Google's the best, as far as I can tell, at utilizing big data to do everything. Uh, but if you go, you're interested in health, you can go to the CDC website where it has all these huge statistical databases and so forth. They try to use big data techniques to figure out when new outbreaks are coming. A lot of regulatory agencies use it. SEC uses big data techniques to try to figure out when there was insider trading uh, and driving. That's actually Google, but you, you're hitting it here first. The next big patent fight is going to be over driverless cars. Uh, at this point, the three big German companies are getting together to try to buy uh, Nokia's mapping service called Here. Uh, they have their own proprietary technologies that they are patenting. Uh, you believe the public reports, they're worried that Google is going to give their technology to the world. I don't believe so. I think what they're really worried about is Google won't. So for those of you who are in patent and make money off of it, this is the next great patent war. Um, workforce science, we collect datas on our, data on our workforces. You've heard about the badges that some companies are making employees wear so that they can track everybody, see what they're doing, figure out what the social networks are. Uh, helps you figure out whom to hire, promote, train, fire. You collect the data, you change your techniques, collect more data, rinse, repeat. Okay, here comes a shameless plug for the Searle Center. We have a project on workforce science in which we are 
assembling databases and helping to do some of this work. And there's the website, which I'm sure all of you can write down instantly. So let's talk about what next. Maybe regulation and big data, right? You collect lots of data. You model recursively the relationship of the data to the events of interest, like platforms blowing up. And then you adjust the regulatory environment to reduce the risk, which would include exactly, in certain circumstances, some of the structures that were being talked about in the paper. Of course, you'd want to do cost-benefit analysis on doing big data and regulation, because there are costs to acquiring and analyzing the data. You need to find the areas in which we anticipate that the value, in terms of the likelihood of being able to predict and intervene times the value of avoiding problems is greater than the cost of doing so. Some of the papers and comments that have been presented here today have already talked about exactly how to do that. Um, so what would be an example of when collecting the data might not be worth the cost? Okay, Because we've just been talking about huge, horrific things. I spend my life studying the Federal Communications Commission, which sometimes deals with really important stuff and sometimes stuff that just doesn't seem worth the candle. Okay? The old method of distributing broadcast licenses by the FCC was essentially to have a whole bunch of people come in, apply for the license at a zero price, have them explain why they were better than all the other applicants, and then we give the license to one of them for free. Okay? Really, for those of you who are under 40. Um, and in 1965, the FCC issued a policy statement that was supposed to guide this process. It said, oh, there are going to be two really important uh, criteria. Uh, integration of ownership with management, which is to say, will the folks who own the broadcasting station actually work down at the station? We think that's a good thing. And the other is sort of diversification control of media. You can think of this as either an antitrust issue, right? We're trying to uh, reduce the concentration of control, or it's a First Amendment issue. More voices are better. But anyway, two basic things, then other stuff they would sometimes throw in there if they couldn't figure out what to do with these two. Let's talk about integration of ownership with management. So. They used a formula. Uh, people are going to work less than 20 hours a week, didn't get any credit. If you worked more than 20 hours a week, they had this formula. Uh, 1,000 times your ownership share times the number of hours per week divided by 40 squared. That was your credit, right? <laughs> really? I don't make this stuff up. So, so this woman named Susan Bechtel, she applies for a license in the lovely town of Selbyville, Delaware, right? And she was the only one who did not promise to actually work at the station, right? She was a dentist or something like that. You know, what sort of a world would it be where you took dentists out of the dental office and had them choosing which records to play in Selbyville, Delaware? Crazy, right? But the other three all promised to do it, right? So churning through the formula, of course, she got a zero for credit. So the FCC gave the, uh, the broadcasting license to one of the other applicants, and she sues. And, and she gets this really cranky guy, Judge Williams, uh, to write the opinion in the case of the DC Circuit. And she claimed that the use of this integration criterion was arbitrary and capricious. Okay? So this was, of course, this was back in 93. And, um, and did Judge Williams rule that the use of this criterion was arbitrary and capricious? Yes. This was one of the 30% of cases down at the, the lower court level where they say yes. So partly he said it was factual. When the 65 policy statement was adopted, the effects of the criterion were entirely predictive. It was going to further the public interest. And in 30 years, the FCC had gathered how much data? Nothing. And so they had no more data. He said, come on. You can't be predictive forever. Give us some facts. Okay? And this is not the only case of the DC Circuit claiming annoyance with the FCC's failure to check to see if its policies are working. It's also partly theoretical. Williams was really skeptical about a world in which you take dentists and force them to work in broadcasting stations instead of, say, hiring a manager, right? I mean, the world has managers, right? So was the FCC irrational for the failure to monitor and revise the regulation on the base of the data? I think probably not. It was a really silly regulation in the first place. It was implemented only because the DC Circuit had been kicking them in the rear end in the first half of the, you know, the 1960s. They finally did something. 
And they were trying to implement what was fundamentally an internally consistent and really silly regulatory system. So why would you collect data trying to figure out if that would work, right? The value of the data would have been infinitesimally small. There would have been no clear connection between the data and the public interest because no one could agree on what the public interest meant. On the other hand, when you have nice big explosions and fires and people dying and huge amounts of pollution, it might be worth the cost, okay? So we need to sort of figure out when and where you want to do big data, you know. These are sort of best cases. Oh, we're gonna pollute an area the size of Texas. Probably a bad thing and worth spending a few bucks avoiding. Now here's, here I'm gonna sort of disagree a little bit with an assertion at the beginning of the paper that modularity crossed with risk increases the value of sort of recursive regulation. In particular, there's a claim that increasing modularity produces more risks that are hard to anticipate. First question, are we doing more modular production? Almost certainly, yes. Consider autos. Uh, that's a turbocharger up there for those of you. Right? If, if you have a car with a turbocharger on it, chances are better than 50-50. It was manufactured by a firm called Borg Warner, which is in Michigan, right next door. And we actually manufacture them here and ship them all over the world. So you got an Audi with a turbocharger on it, it probably came from Borg Warner. And we found out all about this uh, from the auto parts price fixing cases. I don't know if anybody teaches antitrust here. But it's a wonderful set of cases where for 30 years, 20 years, parts manufacturers have been fixing prices to the car companies around the world. And, and we have this airbag scandal which you might have read about, talking about some faking, the safety results, and a dozen car manufacturers, all of whom bought the, the airbags from the same manufacturer. So what are, what are automobile manufacturers now? They're assemblers, right, essentially. I mean, they design. But do they actually, how much of the stuff do they manufacture in-house? Some, but not, all, not nearly what they did, say, back in the 50s and 60s. Does this generate greater deep uncertainty? Well, the argument that you read in the paper, the interactions within modules can produce unanticipated risk. And, and the answer is, yeah, sometimes. But, but I'm not sure whether on balance it actually overall increases the unknown risks. Often there are standard setting organizations that are involved in setting standards on the modules. I know this stuff best from the smartphone world, but this is true in many parts of the world. Where you have standard setting organizations involved, one of the things you, you earn points for is figuring out problems with the other modules that they have to work with. And the engineers that get sent to the standard setting organizations get brownie points, they get a higher career trajectory for figuring out these bad interactions ex ante and having all the other engineers in the room see that they figured it out first. In addition, you have to compare this to what was the state of the world when the production was being done in-house? GM is a great example. Go back to cars. Well, they had different divisions doing transmissions and engines, tires they were still basically buying. But so how was the communication between the various parts of GM? Was it better or worse than the communication between the the companies that were a part. Well, we don't really know, but we do know that the worst cars in history, which was the pre-1965 Chevy Corvair, pictured up there in blue for you, that's a 64, which was an awful, awful car. Uh, and the, the Ford Pinto, they were both produced before the age of modularity. So you can color me skeptical uh, that modularity increases systemically deep uncertainty. Still, bringing big data to regulation, I think, could be very valuable. Or not, depends on the situation. Uh, I'm not going to say much about this. I, I found it really interesting, but I don't have the sort of knowledge that helps me critique it, applaud it. Uh, I do know that I hope we avoid gigantic, huge catastrophes in the future. Uh, what big data would say is put sensors in the drilling rigs, right? Don't depend on operators to report stuff. Just put electronic sensors that measure vibration measure gas, measure temperature, put them in and, you know, read it every five seconds, dump it into terabytes of storage, and have computer scientists 
work on it, and see if you can predict with big data techniques when the problems are coming up. I mean, that's what it would start to look like, okay? And, you know, much like auto, automatic braking systems in your car, right? Can we predict when you're going into a skid? Yes, and we release the brakes, right? So, actually, that's all I'm going to say. So, so the lesson for the case studies, I don't know. It all fits together, right? Bureaucratic structures matter, people matter, corporate coordination matters. I don't know how they all fit together, but I'll leave that up to the folks who are experts at the oil industry to figure out. And that's all. Can I make it? Can I make it? Great. Um, well, I really enjoyed the paper, and um, I think Matt and I are probably covering the waterfront in terms of the comments, because mine are going to go in a totally different direction, um, but I think they're complementary, um, in a sense, of the kinds of things he had to say. Um, unlike Matt, I'm actually not skeptical about what I perceive to be the core thesis. Namely, the idea that when we have these global supply chains, or I think what Chuck called collaborative production models with multiple actors along the supply chains, I'm persuaded by the paper and even in thinking in the abstract that these present a whole new set of important challenges for regulation and also for getting at some of the deep uncertainty. Um, I also love the Norway oil case study. I love the grounded features of it and all the information. I don't have tacit knowledge. I don't have the expertise. But I like how that fits together. So my comments actually are not skeptical at all. Um, but instead, what they really ask for is more. Um, more analysis, more pulling out, and trying to extract more normative lessons, because I feel like you're headed that direction, that you're seeing something good there. I'd like to know more about what it is that's working and that's good. Um, so I'll talk about that, and the first part of my comments, I'll actually restate what I believe is the core th argument, um, just to make sure uh, at least I'm clear about what I, I see it being. And then I'll go ahead and talk about some of the ways I can see drawing out more normative lessons, and then also talk relatedly about stepping back and trying to understand what this case study tells us with, re in, with respect to the larger regulatory terrain. In other words, how does this case study sort of fit in the larger map of issues. So um, on the basic argument, uh, as I understand it, and I think Chuck reinforced this, the idea is that um, the old model with respect to having a cat and mouse, where our regulators are our cats, and they're trying to catch the mice, the regulated industry, and use prescriptive rules and essentially hold them accountable to those prescriptive rules, really isn't going to work. Um, in situations of catastrophic risk in global supply chains where there's all these pieces. Uh, the reason it doesn't work is because these prescriptive rules can't begin to capture the complexity going all the way down the chain, and things are moving so fast, so dynamic, so many pieces of the puzzle changing over time that we see the regulated industries read these long lists of rules, and we have several blowouts. In the meantime, they simply can't keep up, and it keeps their eye away from the ball. So the new model um, that I see essentially emerging from the paper is the idea that we don't get rid of the regulator, um, but instead the regulator serves as a foundation. And it drives the regulated parties to go find this information and all this complexity and sort of be at the dynamic cutting edge. And so that the regulator is essentially supporting this relationship, but not driving it. Um, and so beneath this, is, this is the part I'm particularly persuaded by, this idea running through the paper is this focus on global supply chains or uh, collaborative production models. Again, many different actors. And it seems to me that the core intuition there of how these present a problem is almost like a tyranny of small decisions. We have a, a number of actors in a supply chain. Each of them have a little piece. Each of them have some information about the risks that their component part presents, but they don't have a holistic view. They might not even be making the right decisions. Um, but the transaction costs and the coordination costs of understanding what's going on all the way along those supply chains are just too great. And so nobody does it. So the role of the regulator here, the, the role of the, the larger picture, is to reduce those <coughs> transaction costs and coordination costs essentially by encouraging um, those in the supply chain to talk to one another and figure out how to reduce essentially the risks going through the supply chain. So as I understand it in Norway at least, one of the main roles of the regulator in this new regime 
um, is to encourage the, the integration vertically and horizontally of these different suppliers to talk to one another to try to get a sense on the deep uncertainty and figure out how to essentially try to minimize those risks and also to extract the lessons and almost in a positive externality way to display them, to disseminate the kind of learning that we're getting from these um, encouraged discussions so that we, we have a much better base for industry in the future. Um, so the component pieces in Norway that are drawn out in the paper um, that seem to start to make all these pieces fit together and have the regulator in the right role is the idea of just sort of a base of strict liability. Um, some worker engagement, essentially, in what the firms are doing is mentioned. These are just uh, descriptive features of the Norway example. Risk reporting is going on by the regulator. Best practices through a trade association that the industry is developing, and also these industry consortia. So here at this point, this is how I, I understand the paper. This is my um, account of what it's offering us. Now I'll move into the comments. So the comments are that we have this conceptual idea of how a regulator and regulated can work collaborative together in this very difficult area of global supply chains trying to, to essentially get at these uncertainties. And we see descriptively that we have Norway that seems to be pushing things along, but it's not clear how the, how the engine works. I'm not clear on how these pieces fit together to make things better or if there's a normative model that we can draw out of this in terms of thinking in the future about how to structure regulatory, regulated relationships to really get at that deep uncertainty. So for example, with respect to these um, different component parts, the paper talks about them at length in very helpful ways, but it just stays shy of pushing us into a more normative model. And it's easy for me to say as a commenter, um, because you know I don't stick my neck out on a limb, but I just feel like it's on the edge of giving us a much more robust model. So the 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 um, it talks descriptively about how workers are actually mandatorily have to be engaged in these industry plans. A very fascinating idea. I liked it theoretically. In the paper, though, it actually almost seems to suggest that it does no work. Um, that that feature, if we played Jenga with Norway and looked at all the things in Norway, we could actually pull out worker engagement and nothing would change in terms of, of how well the interactions are working. We also see the paper repeatedly refer to risk reporting. Risk reporting is going on. The regulator is requiring essentially these annual risk reports. There's a variety of functions risk reporting could be doing in this regime to draw out the regulated. I'd like more discussion of that and understanding. It was actually my impression that one of the major functions of risk reporting was actually reputational signaling. That instead of just getting a sense of what's going on over time or even regulators seeing certain kind of hydrocarbon <coughs> leaks, what was really going on was pulling out the very best firms and putting them out as leaders and creating sort of a spiral to the top and maybe also identifying the laggards so that the risk reporting was really actually vital to the mechanics or the engine of this regulatory machine, essentially by drawing out the, the good guys and the bad guys and creating these kinds of incentives. Here we have um, uh, the, also the, the trade association gets these uh, folks together and the paper has a very rich description of just how um, vigorous these discussions are about trying to minimize catastrophic risks of blowouts and how the industry gets together and develops its own best practices with great pedagogical value. And I buy all that. I buy the idea that the industry is really engaged in a vigorous, meaningful effort at best practices. But I must say that that's different from my impression of other industries that do best practices, where their least common denominator shields that really are not vigorous or at all engaged. So again, in the paper, I would be curious about what's going on here to get it right. Is it that strict liability is terrifying the industry, so they really do want to minimize the risks? Um, is it that we already have raised up the industry leaders, so the leaders take a role, essentially, in guiding best practices, but it seems to be an important part of the mechanics. There's a mention in the paper as well about industry consortia, and there's almost a profit incentive for them to vertically integrate and minimize risks and engage in, I guess, technical innovation. I wasn't sure what role that played in the engine. If we got rid of the consortia, we'd still have a fine system, or are they engaged in the outer edge technological innovation? In other words, how do these pieces fit together? Um, and what do we make of it in terms of thinking about the future? Also, in terms of, of sort of the normative model, it, it's my impression that the regulator 
essentially plays a relatively passive role. They're an enabler, they're excited, they're trying to engage, maybe use risk reporting to draw people out, but otherwise they really sit on their hands and don't want to get engaged. Um, that's my sense of the descriptive account in Norway. I'm wondering normatively if that's the right account or if we could think more critically about it. It worries me a bit to think of regulators not engaged, at least in policing the laggards, um, without getting involved in prescriptive rules, at least finding those that are likely to lead to some catastrophic risks and engaging. So thinking about the role of regulators maybe more actively or at least talking about the different ways they might be engaged. Okay, so the last uh, comment I have is really, how do we think about this particular case study um, and even global supply chains? in the larger area of, of regulation. And I have to say, um, to me, I, my specialization is mostly toxics and cancer and junk like that. And so for me, I look at blowouts as just a fantasy for regulation. I can't imagine a better situation for regulation. Um, because think about it here in terms of deep uncertainty and incentives. The incentives lead to a very strong change. Um, when things blow out, I don't even think that is a negative externality. The industry essentially pays for it. The industry gets huge reputational hits when they have these ca catastrophes or near catastrophes. We have strict liability as well to reinforce the costs associated with that. Um, and even the regulators have egg on their face when we have catastrophes. So the market, the courts, and the regulatory ar artifice all work to create strong, powerful incentives in this case study to figure out what the heck is going on and minimize those risks. Very powerful, perfect world. Imagine, by the way, if the risks that we were trying to avoid were instead ecological harms from oil rigs or cancers to workers on oil rigs. I don't think we would necessarily, even though it's a global supply chain, I don't think we would necessarily see the same picture and the same sort of solutions coming out of it. Um, so in my thinking, again, taking the global supply chain and realizing that it's a pretty pervasive thing, it seems to me that maybe what we really have are categories of global supply chains that we should think about in regulation. We have one category, which is Norway, where the incentives are to use the situation to get a deep uncertainty. And the major problems of the global supply chain are just transaction coordination costs. But we have a different kind of chain, um, which we could see in, in consumer products, where I would argue there are still potentially catastrophic risks, where some of the links in that chain have deep-seated asymmetries in information. We have rational incentives for ignorance, um, or we have uh, rational incentives for deep suppression of damaging information. So even asbestos as a link in the supply chain or the introduction of certain chemicals into a consumer supply chain, some post-market uh, post drug testing, for example. I have a, a pizza box a PFA uh, article that was in the New York Times just on Monday about the PFAs that spilled from West Virginia. It turns out they're used in a variety of products, so we have kind of a, a supply chain going on, even in pizza boxes where they show up in food. We know very little about the risks, uh, but DuPont makes about 20 million a year on them. So that would be an example where we have deep-seated asymmetries in that supply chain. What I like about that, or you know, as an academic, of course, mm -hmm. is that, wow, what a great regulatory problem, right? Um, that it's not just a single actor, but we have deeply embedded asymmetries in the supply chain. How in the world do we do that? And I think Chuck's article sort of opens up this whole new world. So I would suggest maybe thinking about the possibility um, of multiple global supply chains and almost a taxonomy of this particular new problem of supply chains or collaborative production, some with asymmetries, some with not, um, weak, plastic, I don't know, whatever the word may be, it seems like a new uh, serious problem and we may be able to start to categorize it and think about it differently. Now the reason I think we need to think about it differently is if we do have, for example, a different kind of global supply chain with embedded asymmetries. Is the right answer to that industry consortia with best practices? Um, or some of the risk reporting when we have deeply embedded stubborn asymmetries where uh, certain industries don't want to fess up to the potential harms. So in other words, it seems like we have a whole different set of problems potentially in that area. 
So I just wanted to step one more step backwards um, and think about, <clears throat> I don't know if this works. It's very preliminary. I know, it, in fact, it doesn't work. Um, but if we think about global supply chains as a new entrant to our thinking about regulatory studies or a new problem, how do we place it in the larger area of regulation? And so I think a lot of us tend to think of single actor models. There's no chain, a single actor model. We have uh, a situation where we don't have stubborn asymmetries in the industry, almost nuclear, where it's a relatively easy thing to, to, to address. Um, in single actor models, we have situations where we do have stubborn asymmetries. And in those cases, it seems to me, certainly our cat and mouse prescriptive rules actually still are an extremely valuable way to get at those problems, that we wouldn't want to throw them overboard um, or, or go too quickly into thinking about industry best practices, for example, in this kind of situation. And Chuck um, adds in his paper, it seems to me at least, this, this upper level, um, this upper row, where we're talking about global supply chains. And again, I've suggested maybe to think about them preliminarily as broken out into supply chains where there's strong incentives to work together, um, as opposed to those where there's not. And how in the world we'd ever address those in regulatory models, I have no idea. But I think the whole puzzle is really an interesting one. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Um, but I really enjoyed the paper, and uh, it gives us a lot to think about. Thanks.